Thank you so much. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, next is uh, Amanda Holt, citizen. <laughs> Not a long title, right? Just citizen Amanda Holt. Uh, great to have you. And uh, you ready? I'm green. Green. It says it's green. Is that better? I need to lean in closer. I'll yeah. lean in closer. There you go. Perfect. There you go. Uh, if you don't mind raising your right hand, uh, we'll swear you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is true to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? If so, please indicate by saying I do. I do. The floor is yours, ma'am. You should have in front of you a copy of my written testimony. A summary of key conclusions is on the first page. Without a standard, it is impossible to uniformly evaluate a congressional plan. Established rules leave much up to interpretation and supposition. Clear and measurable standards are needed to safeguard the map drawing process. There are five basic criteria that form a solid foundation on which to build a redistricting plan. It is essential to have transparency and clarity on how the criteria will be defined, prioritized, and balanced. And beginning on page six are some suggested measurable standards and how they might be prioritized in congressional redistricting. If you turn to page two, you will see eight maps pictured. Now, as you look at these maps, think about this question. Which map is the best map? How would you determine which map should be approved? The only way to answer that question is to have a standard. But what should the standard be? There are limited rules in Pennsylvania regarding congressional redistricting, which leave many key decisions at the discretion of those creating and finalizing a congressional plan. For example, decisions which have the greatest impact on the final map include the overall range of the population, map criteria, and the starting map used whether you start with a blank map or begin with the cores of prior districts. Both the 2001 and the 2011 congressional maps were overturned in court. So how does the General Assembly plan to create a defensible map which will respect the people and stand up in court? And I suggest that this is achieved by having clear and measurable standards. The current map provides an illustration of what happens when you compare a stated goal with the final congressional plan. The goal was to create compact and contiguous districts which did not divide any jurisdiction except where necessary to ensure equality of population. Yet the final plan contained more divisions overall to counties, municipalities, wards, and voting precincts compared to other plans. As you can see in the illustration, the other maps submitted to the court achieved population equality with fewer divisions than the final congressional plan. Because of this, it raises the question as to the true meaning of the stated objective. At the end of the day, the court remedial map did little to bring resolution to the underlying issue of a redistricting process without firm, measurable standards. There are five basic criteria, which at a minimum are generally accepted priorities. One, respect minorities. Two, equal population. Three, preserve political subdivision boundaries. Four, contiguous. And five, compact. My recommendation is to focus only on getting these five basic priorities established for use in 2021. Follow the clear guidance available through federal case law and common practices to define how the criteria 
will interplay with each other. This core structure can always be refined, improved upon, and added to later. What are characteristics of better redistricting criteria? And I suggest four. One, clear objectives. Two, limited criteria. Three, transparent priorities. And four, enforceable outcomes. And a further explanation of these is available in my written remarks. I think the court articulated a sound objective when it said to not divide political subdivisions unless needed for equality of population. Connecting these two principles, population equality and preserving jurisdictions, is not new. The minutes of the 1968 Constitutional Convention recorded the same intent when explaining a similar law. Nearly 80% of the jurisdictional divisions in the current congressional plan could have been avoided. These excessive splits affected millions of Pennsylvania residents. So what are some suggested measurable standards? One, permit use of at least a small population deviation to achieve legitimate state objectives. In looking at other states in 2010, 12 states did not have districts exactly equal in population. That is 28% of the 43 states which draw congressional districts. And there's more information on this in the appendixes of my written testimony. Two, no voting precinct should be divided in forming a congressional district. There is perhaps no division more confusing to a voter and costly to the state than one made to a voting precinct. Over 50% of the excessive jurisdictional divisions were to voting precincts in the current congressional map. Three, no division to any municipality smaller than a congressional district. Our Constitution outlines some key standards which are valuable to Pennsylvanians. One criterion has been present in every Constitution since 1790, respecting the boundaries of political subdivisions. This value has a long-standing history of being a legitimate Commonwealth interest in Pennsylvania's redistricting process. Every municipality in Pennsylvania, smaller than a congressional district, should be afforded the benefit of maintaining this 200 plus year tradition. There are benefits to using standards such as no municipality can be divided unless it exceeds the size of a congressional district. It is something that can be easily fact checked. It would be obvious upon examination if no municipalities were divided. It is a clear and measurable standard. Over 30% of the excessive jurisdictional divisions were to cities, boroughs, or townships in the current congressional map. Four, minimize divisions to counties and wards. Just because some counties and possibly Philadelphia wards will have to be divided in the redistricting process, limits should still exist. It is also important to consider this number overall and not just within a county. For example, eliminating a division in one county might mean it creates a division in another county. Over 10% of the excessive jurisdictional divisions were to counties and wards in the current congressional map. Five, first try to respect both minorities and the place where they live. Many times, a VRA district can be created without dividing a jurisdiction. For example, it was unnecessary in 2011 to extend a congressional district beyond between Philadelphia and Delaware County in order to provide a minority district. Instead, two could have been formed within Philadelphia. Give the minority group the benefit of not only being unified as a minority, but also unified within the place they live. Six, consider Chester County to be contiguous. Small geographic anomalies in Pennsylvania should not necessitate jurisdictional divisions. They should be treated as if they were contiguous to their jurisdiction 
as they have always been. And then, I've got my paper mixed up here. Ah, the last page is in the folder. Seven, do not attempt to define a specific measurement for compactness. The places people live seem to matter more than the ultimate shape of their district. Because of this, I believe a jurisdiction should not be divided only to improve the compactness score of a district. And then lastly, two process suggestions. One, instead of working from existing district boundaries, start from a blank map without consideration of district numbers. And two, Focus on achieving the primary objectives before taking into account any secondary considerations. If a secondary consideration conflicts with the primary goal, then the primary goal should be followed. Secondary goals should never be achieved at the expense of the main objectives. It is critical the General Assembly invest energies and resources into establishing clearly defined and measurable standards and then using these standards in the 2021 congressional redistricting process. You have the opportunity this year to leave a legacy of people before politics. Today can be the first step toward that legacy by supporting measurable standards in the congressional redistricting process. Thank you very much, Ms. Holt. And that is our final testifier for stakeholder input in Congress. Bear with me, I gotta pull up uh, the hearing schedule. Um, our, uh, Hearing schedule will be field hearings April or August 24th, 25th, and 26th, starting in northeastern Pennsylvania, sweeping through that. Uh, hopefully, as, as soon as possible, we'll try to get as much information out there on locations, times, et cetera, uh, so we have maximum input. Again, we do have PennsylvaniaRedistricting.com as a catch-all website. All the testimony is posted there. The videos, I believe, are already loaded onto there. Uh, it is Everything is streamed from that point. Uh, we do have general comments uh, as well as comments on the current 2018 maps. Uh, and you're able to draw communities of interest as soon as we do have the data. Uh, probably a few weeks after that, um, we will have, citizens will be able to actually draw and submit their own maps as well. Um, so pretty, pretty cool stuff. Technology is great. So hopefully we will, we will have maximum input from the citizens of Pennsylvania as we move forward. Uh, that's all I got. Any final? Nothing. Oh, absolutely. Um, so thank you all for attending, and the committee is adjourned.